From the Woodshed, a casual conversation with Chase Morrill and Ryan Eldridge of Kennebec Cabin Company, the team that inspired the hit show Maine Cabin Masters. From the Woodshed is brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp, trust the quality. By Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. By Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And by Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. Now, from the Woodshed Studios in Manchester, Maine, it's Chase and Ryan. From the Woodshed, I'm Chase Morrill. With me, as always, Ryan Eldridge, Maggie Morrill. Hi. We're here to talk about all things Maine, all things cabin, all things Maine cabin related. Our guest today is Steve Bromage. He's the executive director of the Maine Historical Society. He's here to talk with us about... Is he going to test us too, like Maggie, probably? I'm sure we can test him. I bet he is a treasure trove of trivia about Maine. And if, you, if you're going to be in charge of a historical society, what a great state. Yeah. And apparently it's a very old society, almost as old as a state. Who knew? But we'll find out more shortly. You can find out more about us at KennebecCabinCompany.com, MainCabinMasters.com, Facebook, Instagram, Kennebec Cabin Company YouTube channel, our online store at shop.kennebeccabincompany.com. And we couldn't do this without you turning it, tuning in our fans and our sponsors, Nelma, Northeast Lumber Manufacturing Association, Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers, Hammond Lumber Company, the official building materials supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company, and Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. Man, that was a quick week, wasn't it? Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing when the when the clocks get you know when the, the days get short the time flies by. Yeah, I feel like I was just here. <laughs> We're stuck in a time warp. But ski season's getting close. Ski season's getting close. Halloween's over. On to Thanksgiving. People are already stressing out about being able to get Christmas gifts for this season. Are they still on the container ships everywhere? So yeah. when we were in California, you could look out and you could, we could see a bunch of them out there. Could you really? Yep. I saw some of my stuff from Amazon I was waiting for. <laughs> so yeah, you just got back from L.A. Yeah. It was, um, what an experience. Like, it was quite a d- different world than I'm used to. Like, we literally stayed in Hollywood. Yeah. And that was because of our good friend Andrew Ryan from Main Shack. His, he's on, like, the friends and family discount. But we stayed in some, we, we, I actually stayed at Ritz-Carlton. And stayed in Hollywood. Like, I mean, there was literally like Lamborghinis out front of the hotels and stuff. Like, yeah. It's, it's, what amazes me is just how much sp- it's spread out. Like, so, so big. You can't even see the Hollywood sign. I figured the Hollywood sign would be like, whoa, <laughs> prominent. I looked out, it's like that big, way out in the middle of like, middle of nowhere. Yeah. And like, you have to drive like on interstates to get anywhere. Like, it's, it's so big. Yeah, I had In-N-Out Burger. That was darn good. Was That that wasn't your first one. That was one. my first one, yeah. Re- they're and I, they're and so good. I, and I was with an expert, so we did animal style. Yeah. We did this. We did that. Like, like, did you go awesome. to uh, Venice Beach? Yeah, went to Venice Beach. Yeah, went, went right where they were working out. Uh, walked the boardwalk. Cool. Didn't see any Hollywood stars, though. None? No. Mm. And that yeah, it was fun. Paid like $10 of juice for breakfast. Like... <laughs> Even though oranges are, like, right there. Right there. Right there. But we ate some good food. You know, like, the pandemic, we've kind of, like, it's been good to us. We kind of, like, we don't go out as much and, like, yeah. stay home. So it was fun to go out and eat and, like, drink some wine. And Do you go to – how many shows did you go to? Three shows. Hollywood Bowl is amazing. Like, it's just this this bowl, and it's all about the sound. And there's almost 18,000 people. I've never seen a design like that. Like, everyone's just right there. Like – Normally you're at a place in this field, and this and that. Like, yeah. it's pretty, and you could buy wine. It was, it was definitely LA. <laughs> you were coming back with bottles of wine. There was escalators. I was like, I'm out of my element. There weren't escalators. Oh yeah, really? Outside escalators at the place. Wow. But you know, I got to. I did Uber. Um, I got to do Uber Eats. I got to do DoorDash. Like, I got to use that technology we're not yeah. used to. Yeah. I had like four things canceled. I was so mad. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at technology. When we were in Atlantic City, we were seeing fish. I ordered breakfast. You know how hard it is to order breakfast or order on those apps? Yeah. You, how do you want your eggs? 
well, do you want them from this field? Do you want them organic from this field? Do you want them to be like from this farmer? <laughs> it takes like 20 minutes. I, so I ordered all this food one day. I was so proud of myself. It went to um, Las Vegas. I was so mad. I was so hungry. Oh, yeah. They, they, I'm like, it's Eldridge Room 515. Like, we don't all have your reservation. I'm like, I was, I was like, I'm in gosh darn Caesar's Palace. <laughs> Oh wait, this went to LA. What this went to Las Vegas. <laughs> so anyway, so so DoorDash. So I download Uber Eats. I'm like, I'm gonna order breakfast for Ash, everyone. I'm like, all proud of myself. I mean, this takes me probably you know 20 minutes to do. Then I'm tracking it, and I see the guy. First sign should have been he's on a bicycle, and I was ordering for four people, right? So I see the bike go up to this place. Oh, and the name of the place, Egg Slut. <laughs> That's the name on the building. So I had to order there. Can you believe that? Egg slut. E G G S L U T. On That's the side. Pretty great. On the, I, I thought it was awesome too. <laughs> so works. he's on it. So <laughs> my bike guy's on his way to egg slot. I see he picks it up. I see him coming back to me and then orders canceled. I never get mad or hold a grudge. Like and, and I write Drew's like, you never get mad. Like because I was tracking it and it said order canceled and it's just gone. I mean I could taste the egg slot. <laughs> it was so good. What like, do you mean it was canceled? I think he got hit by a car or something. I, so <laughs> it, they didn't tell me. And I was like, and I was like, this is unacceptable. Like, what happened? And they're like, well, he spilled the food. So next thing you know, I'm doing a GoFundMe because he's probably in a hospital or something. <laughs> that was one of my highlights. <laughs> like, you can't do that stuff in Maine. Yeah, you can. You can DoorDash to here. Let's do it right now. We just signed up. Oh, so the woodshed signed up for DoorDash. Like, can I get DoorDash in West Gardner? Uh, there's mm. a radius. See, yeah, yeah, probably see, not. See, that's why I went to LA. Right, right, right. But it was pretty. It was fun. Like, I was out of my element, and I'm glad to be back home where I go to get my food if I want it. Right. And there's no derogative names on buildings and stuff. <laughs> Yet. All the eggs are classy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, we should probably go watch this video from our friends at Hero Media Network. <laughs> you know, change the scene here, look at something nice. So check out this video, guys, and we will be back with our friend Steve and a lot of cool historical stuff. Twenty-two years ago when we started our farm, we knew nothing about wool. I knew plants and knew I wanted to combine the two. There were few natural dyers then, so I found a book full of historical dye information and set to work learning how to properly dye to create lasting color. Helping to preserve and perpetuate the dye work has put me on a path forward yet reflective. Many of the colors we create are references to our little farm ecosystem. The colors tell the story of a particular growing season. The hue values differ year to year. I love not having control over that. It's the color of nature. Natural dye work has many steps. Everything else moves so fast. Dying allows me to slow down. Time outside gathering plant material, tending a garden, watching gently simmering dye pots allows time for observation. I feel close to the creatures that live here. It's the perfect combination of art and science. And we are back with Steve Bromage from the Maine Historical Society. You're the executive director of the Maine Historical Society. Indeed. You All got right. That. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds very formal and important. Yeah. Um, we'll start out first. Water, coffee, or beer? Beer would be great. Excellent. Perfect. Because we have our wonderful Dash seltzer. Today we have the blueberry. Um, we love Dash. Excellent. Great stuff. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about what the Maine Historical Society and what you do. Sure. Uh, well, it's a pretty neat organization. We're actually almost 200 years old. We, uh, we have our 200th birthday next year. But our mission is to preserve and share Maine's story. Um, so we've been collecting uh, 
all kinds of historical objects, papers, uh, photographs, etc., going back for that 200 years. Um, we've got a museum down in Portland. Uh, we have the Longfellow House as part of us. Okay. Um, we've got a research library. We've got a museum that does exhibits every year. And then one of the coolest things is something called the Main Memory Network. It's an online museum that lets historical societies, communities all around the state scan photographs and I items from their collections and upload it into this website. So it's an amazing place to explore Maine. So you're based out of Portland? We are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you're kind you you work with local historical societies? Are is there affiliation or is it just kind of an open community network type of thing? It's a good question. Uh, because we're in New England and Maine, everybody's a private nonprofit, mm -hmm. you know, so nobody owns anybody. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, so we we work with them in all kinds of different uh, collaborations and partnerships. Like for this main memory network, we provide the infrastructure, training and support, but we work really closely with them to identify stories, collections, exhibits. You know, there really are different stories about how Maine has developed, what different parts of the state are like. Nice. Yeah. And what would you, I mean, there's so many different themes and, you know, traits to Maine. Like, what are some of the most popular? I mean, I, you know, I've got a good idea, but what are some that really stand out? Yeah. Well, I think um, there's a surprising diversity to Maine when you look at the different parts of the state. To me, you know, when you travel around Maine, as you guys do, you know, you can see that every community in the state thrived at some moment in time. And you can see it in the houses and the buildings and the infrastructure. And, you know, there, there, so... So there's been so many dimensions of the history, and it's been tied to the national economy and things going on. Um, and to me, one of the fascinating things, it's just the constant evolution of Maine. And I think a lot of our work, even though it's historical, it's not really so much about looking backwards, but it's about understanding where Maine is today and how we got here, particularly our sense of place. You know, I think it's the, the thing we all love and what's most special about Maine. And I think that that's really just shaped profoundly by, by history. And Maine right now is so popular. You know. The, the food scene, the beer scene, television, like everyone seems to be flocking to Maine. You know, real estate is on fire. Like it's, it's just amazing how popular it is right now. And I think one thing we've learned through the show, what we've talked about is, I thought I knew Maine. You thought you knew Maine. <laughs> but it's so different geographically. There's little, these little areas. Yeah. Like like you go to Rainley, Rangeley, it's like white collar outdoors. I mean, maybe you go to Greenville, it's more like the blue collar. Like you go down to like, Sebago Lake and it's just a different type of per, like person but yeah. it's just all these different areas now the coast of Maine's different than say you know the county but they're all just so amazing and I, I sometimes wonder the most states offer that much diversity I, I don't think they do like I, maybe they do but Maine is just I think we take for granted how special it is I, th I think so. And as I said, I, you know, I think it's it's the thing that binds us together. I mean, it's that special sense of play. I mean, people love, love Maine and feel it in their bones where they've been here for generations and generations, where they visited. Um, I, I mean, it's, again, our great assets. I think it's part of the reason people love shows like yours. Mm -hmm. um, and another way, to, to your point, I think we also all know, like, our little pockets of Maine, our, our, our town, the camp we go to, where we go skiing, yeah. whatever it is. But I think people also get have a feeling that they can't get enough Maine. You know, so I think part of our work is, is helping people introduce and explore and um, discover different parts of Maine because there's so much to get turned on to that is just awesome. Yeah, and I think, too, a lot of it is a lot of places are coming back to their history to help, you know, promote the areas. Like, you know, up way down east, you know, the sardine factories and all that stuff. Like, it's this piece of history that, you know, just helps build that whole story and, you know, draw to the towns. Yeah, I think it's an important part of the identity, too. You know, you look at, like, the paper communities where there's so much change and influx, and um, places like Millinocket for which 100 years just humming, yeah. you know, and you could get out of Stearns High School and make a great living. Um, you knew you had a secure job. You were part of a big thing, and you could have a great camp in the woods, yeah. you know, and all that, you know, so there's a whole lifestyle on that. And so as things change and evolve, I think hanging on to that heritage and how important it's been to Maine people and communities is really important even as we have to keep looking forward and figuring out, you know, what's the economy look like next? Yeah, yeah as you guys are saying, I was trying to think of a place that has thrived continuously, but it, it doesn't really exist because like Chase was saying, the sardine factories, and now you're trying to see these um, companies bringing in do aquaculture, you know, farm-raised stuff on land, yeah. and then like the the paper industry, and come to find out now paper's coming back around. I'm see, I'm hearing a little bit, you know, getting hard to, f you know, harder to find. Yeah. And, yeah. But Maine has to adapt. It's always adaptive. Yeah. But just to what the trends are for the country, you know, 
for the world, really. A hundred percent. I mean, you think back in, you know, when the Europeans first got here, you know, it was the center of this Atlantic world. And, you know, there's so many resources here and it's always been about resources. Um, and you think about how we were feeding ice to the East Coast and lumber, you know, and, and, and just look at trees. You know, that's mm -hmm. changed constantly from providing lumbers to build a houses to pulp to paper. And, you know, again, there's a lot of really creative stuff happening in the, you know, the woods product stuff. So Good old Eastern oh, White Pine. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah, so, so yeah. Well, Ash and I came home from vacation yesterday, and we were coming through um, at the Kennebunk Port um, rest area. Mm -hmm. Met a guy. He's like, oh, Kevin Masters, you want to take Yeah, we talked to him. He said... He lived out of state for 15 years, and he just moved back because the mill in Rumford's revamping up for a new product. And I thought that was really cool to hear. Yeah. Just yeah. to do more brown packaging, like, to go. Because people are getting rid of the plastic bags and stuff, which is great. Yeah. Like, Maine just um, made them illegal. So now people go into more, like, you know, paper products for to-go products and stuff. Yeah. And I don't know where we fit into uh, you know, cardboard with Amazon and right. everybody oh, shipping right. everything yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. We, hopefully we have a corner of that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought in a poster or an advertisement yeah. from the 1930s, 40s probably. 30s, advertising yeah. lots in Winthrop area. Yeah, wow. indeed. What's a lot going to be 100 years from now? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can we hold that up real quick? Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you hold it right up, they'll be able, they'll be able to. In that direction. But it's the Ashaluna Lake Shores grand opening sale, the greatest news of the times, and large bungalow sites only thirty eight dollars. I was looking for a decimal point, weren't you? Right. Should have bought two. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you said thirties, thirties or so. Yeah. And if you guys don't know, we have done a camp on Ashaluna Lake Shores. Yeah, yeah maybe that's what, maybe that's what it was called before. <laughs> Who knows? So where did you find that? This is an old family heirloom, yeah. actually. Nice. Um, but it, it just shows, I mean, yeah. Maine has always, well, not always, but. Have you ever heard that? For the longest time, been the vacation land. You know, it's, yeah. it's been known as the place to get away. And we, you know, we're a small piece of that tradition. You know, I think we're very fortunate to be able to, you know, help keep some of these cabins going and stuff in vacation land. But we've seen it more this year than ever that people are like, hey, you know, yeah. rediscovering you know, just the beauty of the state. I'm just trying to wrap, have you, I've never heard of that before. And I, when we lived here, no. have you, had you heard of it before you saw the poster? Completely like, made up, no doubt. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, it was a real estate, somebody sitting in, in a real estate office saying, this sounds exotic, yeah. you know. They got For, me. Yeah, that kind of. years later. Because I did Google, you know, like uh, all over the place. I'm like, there's nothing. There's some. Not a word but of it. Nothing. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that, but that's also interesting too, because that's where my family's camp is. Um, and, but one of the things it has is it's a, a map between Providence, Rhode Island and in Winthrop. And it literally from point A to point B. So my grandfather worked for the Providence Journal and my, they, my folks lived there. So they were kind of coming back and forth. So, you know, it's just so localized to that piece of land and uh, yeah. a market down yeah. there. So uh, it's just really interesting. Yeah. Well, you kind of see that up north too, like. I know, like, if, if people from Gardner, like, a lot of people from Gardner have certain camps in certain areas. And, like, don't put people from Augusta up yeah. in the Allagash. Yeah. And, like, it's funny how that happens. Like That's throughout Maine, too. Like, yeah. the coastal communities, like, Biddeford Pool has a huge contingent, I want to say, from Cleveland. Right. You know, and so people were traveling around the country, in the, you know, th throughout the last 150 years to, to pockets like that. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I think we still see it continuing where... You know, somebody comes up, does an Airbnb in a certain area, and then they, they start coming every year, telling their friends, and then eventually, you know, it just grows and grows and grows, and these different, you know, communities just transport up here for, you know, a week, yeah. two weeks in the summertime, and it just lends to the diversity of the whole area. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you were uh, making a point about being a small part of this. I'd say, I mean, you're right at, like, the center of that main sense of place and, you know, kind of what our work is really. Yeah. So an, another important part of what we're trying to do is kind of um, recognize the contribution that every diverse person from every corner of the state and from away who comes here, do, you know, the role they play in making Maine what it is today you know, and contributes. And all of these people are part of the Maine story, mm -hmm. right? And But I think the way you get people into it, you know, again, people love Maine. And, and so much of it is that through, like, 
the camp, ex- your camp experience and, you know, generations of your family go into that camp. I mean, it's your soul. I mean, I feel like it's my soul in a lot of ways. And I, you know, every time, you know, with each camp you're doing, there's just so much memories and history. That's why people are oh, redoing completely. them as opposed right, to selling yeah, exact, them. Exactly. Or, yeah. Or, or, or demoing it. Right, exactly. Where That's a, a contractor say. comes in and says, oh, no, this isn't salvageable. But these people want to save their memories because, you know, they're irreplaceable and then they're building their own and we're just... Again, you know, just fixing these places. It's costing more money for the family and time, but we're like you said, we're, Grandpa sat on that porch, or the family kept coming here for yeah. Yeah. generations, and generations. Yes, and yes, locations. You know, tear it down. You can't be in the same spot, right. and a lot of that is lost as well. What, what amazes me is you'd think after, after over time, you'd f- stop finding all this history and all this new stuff, and you still find little tidbits like. Probably I don't. We would just we're doing a camp right now. We can't give too much information. Yeah, be careful here. <laughs> but I mean, you couldn't even you you don't when you see this episode, you're not even gonna make up what we found. Like you would think that they planted it there and they didn't. Yeah. Like oh yeah, no, it, ab- it was ab- absolutely the, the sign, like it was unbelievable. Like and you still see stuff like that over and over and like, just so much history in Maine. Yeah. Well, we get the same thing, you, you know, and, and, and the fact that pickers haven't found that yeah. stuff, whatever. But you know, I, I was walking the dog like two weeks ago, five thirty in the morning. I ran into, I fell into the conversation with this guy, and his father was one of the, like the uh, most famous basketball co- high school basketball coaches in Maine. And he was starting to, we were we were talking about that whole story and his trajectory, and he was talking about these materials that existed up at their camp, you know, and. Um, uh, you know, just he was describing what incredible materials are. And they're also sitting out at that camp, and, you know, you, you feel the risk of it, you know, because yeah. fire or something happens you want to save. But it's all this precious stuff. Yeah. yeah. I No, completely. And same thing with the timber. Like you said, the timber industry materials, like one sawmill may, may, may have milled up this one certain style board for so long, and you can just see it spread out in the area. Like, you know, we do a lot of camps in the – great pond area where it's vertical log cedar you know it's it, it's it's pretty fascinating yeah and it's great that and, you guys are helping preserve that and we're just so lucky to go in some of these camps like i'm you know cobbacy is one of my favorite places in the world we've, we've been so lucky to do all these camps on cobbacy and you go in these camps and it's like it's stuck in time and some of the i mean just you wouldn't even believe the pictures they have and how the families passed it down over time and then you know, then you can go down a rabbit hole and you talk to someone else and then they have these pictures and then they find all the old postcards and like, and now with technology too, it's a lot, it's very easy, you know, to, yeah. to, for everyone to, you know, get that knowledge and to learn more. Yeah, well, one of the th- neat things on that main memory network I mentioned, it's got this thing called My Main Stories so people can actually upload their stories and experiences and I was thinking it'd be really neat to launch an initiative around people's camps and cabins, yeah. you know, and you can upload text, a little video, historic photos and just to pull all these together yeah. to, you know, kind of celebrate that part of the main heritage. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just reading your notes and I got the, the museum houses one of 25 known copies of the Declaration of Independence does indeed. Wow. That's pretty fascinating in itself. Yeah. How do we not know that? I feel kind of like a, I feel like a bad Mainer. It's okay. Yeah. You, you know, every every episode we do a uh, question of so you think you know Maine? Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but so the museum has. How did it come about getting the? Yeah. So the the collections that we have are you know just phenomenal. Again, they've been building up over two hundred years, and they come together in all all kinds of ways. The way that came, um, we have an incredible autograph collection that was put together in the second half of the 19, uh, 1800s. And, um, you know, it was what people did at that time. You know, it was a hobby, this doctor. And so he collected um, the, the autographs of all the founders of the Declaration of Ind- Independence, you know, the Continental Congress and all that. And we were processing it, you know, in the 1990s and going through the collection. And literally, wow. there it was, the copy of the Declaration. So it's pretty remarkable that's yeah. unbelievable <laughs> so look carefully you know under those yeah. mattresses when you're Jeez, you know bro. yeah all those old ma- yeah all those right newspapers under the floor that's right. so th- i'm going to stop everything right now but this is a great segue into this right here so a good friend of mine john bopre he owns all the stores up at sugarloaf okay um he i reached out to him about my how lucky we've been when i threw out the first pitch of red Sox, and i off i wanted him to have the ball he's the first person i thought of like his collection is unbelievable. So he just brought this down for Chase and I and everyone here. So that's from um, the 2013 World Series, Boston Strong. Wow. Yeah. So we got to frame it up, and I believe that's Johnny Gomes' autograph. So. Wow. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That's like, awesome. and that's, I mean, this is history right here. It's only, what, yeah. nine years old but, or eight years old. But it's history to us. I'm like, yeah. we got it. So thank you, John. 
<laughs> Sorry to sidetrack, guys. It was a perfect yeah. segue. <laughs> well, but I mean, to be around for the series where the uh, this era where the Red Sox are winning World right. Series, you know, yes. that is uh, connecting and everything else, yep, you know, exactly. And so, Maine Historical Society is celebrating its bicentennial in 2022. Correct. Yeah. So Maine just celebrated its bicentennial. So, I mean. Right then. They set it up right away? That's right. You know, so we were founded two years after Maine became a state. I think from the beginning, people had a sense that history was going to be important to Maine going forward. And uh, again, we've been around collecting ever since, yeah. What's that saying? As Maine goes, so goes the nation, right? Yeah, that's right. Interesting. And so back in the day, were like the signers of the Declaration, were they like the superstars of their... They were. You know, I, mean, I mean, the rock stars of yeah, that yeah. time? Not just the signers, but people, you know, so we've got the Longfellow House. Yep. And Longfellow is a great example of people cannot believe. He was like the worldwide celebrity in the, you know, second half of the 1800s, you know, because think about it, no TV, no internet, yeah. no rock stars. Um, so his poetry, his books, I mean, his poems, everything he was doing, which was in magazines and newspapers, and it was what everybody was reading. So our house, you know, People ever since he was in his 40s were showing up to see the home of the great Longfellow. And so yeah. there was just such a worldwide fame there that it's hard to imagine today. I mean, the history of, like, I grew up in Gardner, so we had, like, e, the E.A. Robinson house. Like, yeah. the, the, the history of, in Maine is just, I mean, a lot of it has to be with one of the oldest states and, you know, coming over sure. across the seas. But it's just unbelievable. Like, all, all the history here. Yeah. You can just go down the rabbit hole for days and days and. Yeah, well, I think, too, you know, back driving through communities, and you just see it in the landscape because of the houses. And you're like, how is that big, grand house in this rural spot? But, you know, every one of these, you know, back to the economy and where we're headed, you know, every one of those, you know, somebody saw an opportunity, and there's a natural resource we have here. There's a workforce. And they took a risk. They invested. They built a mill or a business, Mm -hmm. and that attracted workers, and uh, a community developed, and an identity, you know, and that happens, you know, hundreds of times around the state. Yeah, for sure. So what's your favorite time in Maine history? If you had to pick it, what what intrigues you the most? Like, Oh, that's probably a tough, not a fair question. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough question. Well, I'm a, a, a junkie for all Maine, so I love it all. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just fascinating watching it evolve. You know, it, it's from an economic and growth and demographic perspective. I mean, it's amazing. Maine, in some ways, peaked before the Civil War. You mm-hmm. know, that's when you know our our lumber was feeding Very everything. Industrial. The population was growing, and yep. then after the Civil War, a lot of things moved west. Um, so it's just kind of fac- fascinating to watch the pluck of Mainers kind of finding ways to keep um, the economy going and their communities going. It's pretty fascinating, you know, uh, late 1800s again, you know, L.L. Bean and the whole identi- development of right. the outdoors industry and the beginning of kind of vacation land, um, which was when people really started flocking to Maine from all these different places. And I mean, that also kind of coincides when lobster became like... Non-prison food? Non-prison, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it started being marketed, being like, you know, come to Maine for the fresh lobster. Right around the same time when people started, you know, venturing down east and, bef- you know, like that that spawned its own entire subsection of main culture is just, you know, the lobster itself. Yeah. You know, and um, like that that advertising, like Poland Spring, the, the you know, this magic yeah, elixir, yeah, yeah, like yes. you drink this water, you're going to like infuse <laughs> Maine yeah. and, you know, be transformed in right. some way, shape or form. And I think we still see that, you know, back to yeah. your point about people coming here to eat and um Recreate and all. I mean, I think you know, main sense of place is stronger, and the brand is stronger than ever. I re- I really think technology has given Maine a renaissance because, you know, I remember like thinking about you know trades, the trades versus college, and back in the forties, fifties, sixties, you could work, you go to work in the mill, and you worked the same job forty hours a week, but you could have your camp up north, you could have your snowmobile, but you busted your butt, yeah. you know. And then my you know my stepfather worked in the shoe factory, and in the eighties, those things started to die. And I mean, Maine had some rough, you know, 80s and 90s were tough. And now that technology is getting better, um, information's getting out there. And now we're seeing people come here because they can work from home and stuff. And like, yeah. Maine's definitely having a good renaissance. It's, it's, it's great to see. Yeah. And I think across the board, I mean, you see the farm economy, you know, there's young farmers, mm-hmm. you know, more young farmers in Maine than ever, you know, so um, it's pretty exciting. Everything time, goes I think. in cycles, doesn't it? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. One thing the pandemic has done, as we've seen, is the secrets out about how lucky we yeah. are here, you know, and like, you weigh those six months of crappy weather versus our quality of life, and uh, we'll see after this one. <laughs> <laughs> see how much snow we get. Oh, yeah, right. skiing. Exactly. Yeah. Maine teenagers are the second most stressed in the country. Maine teenagers stressed. Yeah. 
Oh no. Am oh, I gonna no, wear my LLB number, boots? Am I gonna Alaska's number one. <laughs> yeah, it's, what to wear. It's that cold. <laughs> that's, that's not good. I have three of them. <laughs> it's those cold dark winters. Yeah. <laughs> Maggie, what did I tell you? Just put all the clothes you want to wear in your backpack when your dad's not looking change. <laughs> <laughs> so Maggie has a few questions that she's gathered up for you. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Stressed, ready. really? <laughs> Serious. And I walked uphill both ways to school. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> this one is from Brian Johnson. What are three things non Mainers get wrong about the history of Maine? It's a good question. We're not part of Canada. Not part, <laughs> no, but we were part of Massachusetts. But we were part of Massachusetts. <laughs> um, people, you know, Maine is one of the whitest um, uh, states in the union, but we have had a really diverse population for a long time in really interesting ways, strong Chinese, strong African-American uh, populations. A lot of people don't know about that. A lot of people aren't um, aware of what a rich uh, indigenous um, Native American history we have, that the Wabanaki have been here for 13,000 years wow. and were really the stewards of Maine for most of that time. So we're all kind of from away and newer here. And a lot of people weren't, aren't even really aware of, of, that, of the fact that the Wabanaki are here and doing really great things. I don't know how many questions I've answered. Do I need more examples? No. <laughs> Good. Those, those are two great answers. Who's counting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that Chase and I are proud of, like the, the whole humane system and like their, you know, the science that's going up there. I don't think Maine gets enough credit for yeah. all that, you know, with everything that's going on. Hmm. Like yeah, people think, you know, it, I mean, I remember moving out west, like, do you have you have internet? You have tarred roads? Like, <laughs> Maine gets a pretty... Well, one thing I'm not proud of, Prohibition started in Maine. That's true. Right? The Fun. Dow House? Uh, Heck yeah. with that one, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neil Dow. <laughs> right. <laughs> R.I.P. <Yeah. laughs> well, to your point, I mean, I think, you know, if you... The, even though we've been using the Maine woods hard for 150, 200 years, um, they're still in remarkably good mm -hmm. shape. The stewardship has been phenomenal. And so trees, however you, you deploy them, are going to be important to the economy. Mm -hmm. So to your point about humane, you know, the opportunity to be a leader in wood products industry with research and all of those resources, I think, is pretty exciting and important. Very important. And, yes, I was talking to somebody, the ac accessibility to public and private lands, it, yeah. the yeah. way Maine has it set up, is totally unique to most other states in New England. I, I think we take it for granted. Like we re just, yes. You go up north, and I mean, I remember knowing where all these little campsites were. Right. The Snowmobile trails, all that stuff. It's Yeah, and I think that's part of just the common sense groundedness. It's like the mixed use. Like, we can yeah. do all of yeah, these yeah. things mm -hmm. together, and it's not the either or. And just by being sane and communicating, you know, yeah. you can... Uh, yeah, and you know, if, yes, if you're respectable, respectable of this land, then by all means... You know, you're welcome to have access to it. So. And a large majority of it is privately owned, right? Yes. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. You know, and again, Maine's leader. another important thing about Maine people don't know about, you know, it's just it's leadership in the environmental movement. It gets back to that, you know, where instead of – or. Long, for a long time, things were clear cut. But you look at the you know beginning in the 1960s with the care of the water and the rivers and the yeah. stewardship, even from paper land owners of the woods. It's pretty remarkable that again, what good shape our uh, environment is in a short time. A I short mean, time. I remember growing up like you don't go in the you don't swim in the Kennebec, you you don't eat stuff. You know, like yeah, it's come a long ways. In, yeah, you know, 30, 40 years. Yeah. It was, it was cracking me up thinking, thinking about the show and what you guys do, um, you know, just thinking back, back to my camp, and I was thinking about building materials, you know, and, and there's something about a, of a pack rat nature to, you know, what you find underneath a many a, of a cab, you know. And, oh, com completely. And Depression era and stingy Yankees and all of yep. this. So I, I think of, you know, finally we, we did some work on our camp a number of years ago, and I went through it all, but we had 50, 60 years of accumulated building materials that you might need someday. Yep. Yep. And now today you do a project and you just hop in the car and you yep. go to, you know, the, the big box. But but I don't I, know how many coffee cans of bent nails we've found under camps yeah. where you just throw them under there because if you need a nail, you just straighten them out. I mean, I was not a moral disciple, but I'm 100% <laughs> amazed and believe in what they what he, they do. Like, you know I've seen that barn of his get filled two or three times. And it's like a wave. Everything goes in. Everything everything gets used. You know, yeah. and, and it's amazing. And a lot of the times we're saying we do, you know, like demo archaeological demo. demo. Like you can tell, like what time period things yeah. are like. There might not be as many yeah. nails in that 
section of the house because you know times are tough or something. But everything gets used. Yeah. Well, you know that's the, the main way. Yeah, and the room our camp is that was built up from packing crates from right. the local mill. Right. You know, I didn't. I haven't done the. Uh, the deconstruction to prove it, but yeah, <laughs> it's not that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Do you have another question? Yes. Okay. Oh, which one was going? All right. This one is from Marina Bivom. What can you tell us about the Maine Massachusetts connection and how or why they separated? Oh, we could do a dissertation on this. <laughs> coming out of uh, coming out of the uh, the bicentennial. Well, you know, uh, you know, so Maine was part of Massachusetts until 1820, and it had been part of Massachusetts in a number of ways. Um, when the Europeans started arri arriving, the king starts dividing up the land and giving it to big, powerful folks in Massachusetts. So, actually, one of the really cool collections we have documents all that. You've heard of probably the Kenny Beck, Pachepscott proprietors. Maybe you know they had millions of hundreds of thousands, millions of acres in Maine that they were dividing up, you know, from the 1600s and 1700s that really kind of tell that story. So we were part of um, Massachusetts um, and the district of Massachusetts. But over time, Maine consistently got the short end of the st stick, you know, um, not not protected. You know, when, right. the, when the revolution happened, Portland got burned and there wasn't right. a lot of defense. The War of 1812, you know, Maine was kind of left on its own. It was a long way to go to be part of the government. So... The, the time and the condition was just right. We could finally make the move um, in 1820 to, to separate. But it was a long process. They'd been trying to do it for 40 years. And um, it, it's kind of fun. I mean, you know, there's yeah. a, a, an ongoing close relationship, shall we say, with Massachusetts. <laughs> and what, yeah. was it Booth Bay Harbor that was kind of like the uh, ignition? Wasn't there a, a – uh, wasn't there the British or something invaded and they refused – Massachusetts refused to send – troops up it was during the war of 1812 the war of 1812 it, it, yeah, and the coastline just wasn't protected you right, know and right, right, so right. there were a number of, of skirmishes and issues and um again we were just left on our own right. more or less and so then, people yeah. said enough yeah if we're going to defend ourselves we might as well be our own state that's right <laughs> that's right okay um, that means she liked the answer okay phew <laughs> See, normally I have a full ta uh, staff of smart people who can answer the questions. Right? All right. Um, next question. I got to figure out which one I want to ask. Um, all right. Joe Emerson asks, how were the current borders between Maine and Quebec and New Brunswick established? Jeez. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, we actually have great collections related to that. We have all the early boundary maps of when they were setting that. And so it wasn't until really around the 1840 that all of that was established finally um, after after that long after the revolution. So up in, you know, Holton, there was a lot of border issues and tension, but it was around um, 1840s when that was finally um, settled. But back to the economy thing, it's fascinating. You, wouldn't, you couldn't imagine in around 1840 there was a guy up in um, – a Holden, Holton who employed like 2,000 people. Wow. You know, he had That's woods a and forestry operation and was doing farming and all that. But, you know, you'd be hard-pressed to name, you know, 10 employers who had that many employees right. in Maine today. Yeah. So yeah. back to the kind of the mojo and the, the dynamism of the economy for a, a certain period of time. It's wow. kind of interesting. Now, do you, speaking of borders, do you ever get dragged into the Kittery-Portsmouth dispute? Uh, you know, we we were consulted uh, for research and such. Right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't yeah. know if you had any maps or anything that kind of helped set precedent. Yeah, you know, the last time that flared up, it was before I, I, I was in gotcha. charge. <laughs> yeah. And for people that don't know, it's at the shipyard, right? And like some stuff. Right. Give us a quick synopsis. So, I mean, the uh, Portsmouth, Kittery, the naval shipyard's right there. And there's dispute about whether the state line is in the center of the river right. on one side or other. So, I mean, it's, you know, you've got the, sh the naval shipyard right there, which... Wouldn't it go right down the center? That's the way I would think. Which is, you would think. Yeah, 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 but... Don't have expertise <laughs> in that. <laughs> the maze of the things people argue about. Yeah. All right, that's it for questions today. All right. Unless you want a trivia question to test your Yes, let's well, do it. Yes, we've got to do a trivia question. Can't we arm wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> but you're really in the hot seat. <laughs> All right. I would 
ask you which color, but I don't remember which color corresponds to what. We're going to get purple. Purple. Um, that's, that's from a long time ago. No, nope, she didn't like that one. It really is Trivial Pursuit. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. it's uh, So You Think You Know oh, Me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One of my many yard sale finds. <laughs> All right, here we go. What famous Virginian actually wrote a part of the main constitution? Is it the famous Virginian? It's not what I thought the answer was going to be. <laughs> not Thomas Jefferson? Thomas Dole. Thomas Jefferson. Oh! <laughs> that would be the place to go for starters <laughs> if you were grasping that's for Virginians. The, that's the only one. <laughs> That's more Virginia trivia. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah. And find out more about your uh, bicentennial on your website. Yeah, if you go to uh, our website, mainhistory.org, we're also active and busy and sharing a lot of stuff on social media. Um, you can like us. You can become a member of Maine Historical Society. Again, uh, go to that main memory network and start t uh, searching and search for your town, your t hobby of interest, and you're just going to find thousands and thousands of uh, yeah. great Maine stuff. Very cool. Yeah, and, and share your cabin stories. You know, yeah. go go there and put them up. Yeah, sounds us. like a great resource for for everybody interested in Maine. Yeah, and there seems to be more and more of them. So every day, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining yeah, thank us. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's great. And you guys do awesome work. I, I often wonder, you know, um, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I turn it on, it's like back to the thing of wanting more Maine. It's like, oh, I, this I watch, you know, <laughs> this in Northwoods Law, you know, it's <laughs> like, just go. give me Maine, you know. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Cheers. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And now we've got some project pointers for you. If you've got a question about your cabin or build-related questions, submit a short video or question to podcast at maincabmasters.com. We might select yours for next week. And the more detail and info you can provide to us, the more likely we are to answer it. And you send a video, you're definitely in. That's right. That's right. Videos are also welcome. So, yeah, send them in. What do we got today, May? Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. This one is from... Corey Kaufman, I have an older home. Spray insulation is your go-to from what I've seen. I currently have regular R-grade. What can I do to beef up my insulation value? Inter I feel like we need a little more information, but we can shoot from the hip. Yeah. So, he, I mean, if he, is he saying 1800s? Like, if it's 1800s and all the corn cobs are down below, then we're going to say dense packet. Right. But if it's, say, a 1950s ranch and he has old fiberglass. fiberglass, what what can you, like... I would say rip off your side and put an inch of foam on the outside, maybe? Yeah, If so say you had a house and it was sheetrock interior, you had fiberglass insulation on the inside walls, you know, standard plywood I love sheathing this question. and vinyl siding. How do you add more R value? You peel off your... Yeah, I think, I think you're right on you, the money. You put reverse extension jams. Yeah, right? you would. Yeah, and they have that. They have those new films too that like will wrap it really good. And even an R, even if you gain like an R of ten or above, it's going to make a big difference. Yeah, I mean, for every inch of foam, for every inch of rigid foam, you gain an R value of seven. And if it was me, and I was at, the other thing I would do, I would go down in the basement. If I had a concrete basement, I would, I would spray from my sills all the way down below the frost line because I've seen that work and pay for itself yep because what happens is your house is designed to lose air you know you have your, your ridge vent or your you know your gable end vents and when that heat escapes it sucks all that and so i guess that would be a, a good would be do a blower door test right yeah. find out where you are because sealing up drafts it's amazing how much sealing up drafts helps retain heat and explain a blower door for people that don't know so blower door you seal up all your entryways all your windows you put a blower door you put a fan blower and you blow air into the building and you see how quickly and how much air escapes and cubic like feet per minute or something and like where that. it's escaping and it's even amazing with the cabins we do just you know installing new windows and buttoning it up how much heat you know because we get that a lot you know our camp's drafty we want it to hold heat well even without adding insulation just sealing up drafts helps hold in so much more heat i mean you I've, we've even seen 
outlet covers. Now they make the outlet covers that are draft proof. Like, yep. It's amazing. Like you can find. Absolutely. But if it's an older house, what you'll see now, say you go buy an older house built in the 1800s, you're going to see what looks like wine corks yep. you know, every 16 inches because they go, go and they drill in through, through the studs and they blow in insulation. Yep, they'll have a thermal Im- imaging camera where they can find out, you know, where the different bays are, how much insulation is in there, and they can add, you know, whether it's cellulose, or, you know, dense packs, fiberglass dense pack. I think you're you're almost better off to have a house like that than to have the old Pink Panther. Yeah. You think? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's... Because I mean, you can... I love, that stuff's nice when you really pack it in there. Yeah, and, and to pull off all the vinyl siding and build your extension dams, wrap it, it's, I mean, it's it's a lot of work. Either one will pay off in the long run. But yeah, I mean, in the past years, weatherization in Maine has been a big thing is just sealing them up, making them much more draft proof. But at that point, you also have to be aware of air exchange to make sure your hair, your air is also getting regularly changed out. And you could also blow more into your attic space because that will settle over time. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. In your attic space, around your frost, you know, down below your frost in your basement, I think one thing you could say to say before we were doing cabins and stuff, we were all about saving energy and making. Yes. No one wants to be cold and no one wants to spend money on heating the house. Exactly. That may be our best answer. Here. <laughs> you know, I grew up in an old, my dad's house was built in 1820 and I froze my butt off. And I said to my, I remember oh, not I- wanting to get out of bed and just tell him, hey, Rhett, turn the shower. I'm going to run down. I mean, I hated it. I would sit. I said, I'm never going to be cold. Yep. When I get older, I don't care what it costs. Yep. So Dad, cool. our house is freezing. No, no heat till trick or treat. <laughs> that, it, that already happened. Perfect. I think that's tough of that. Go to Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Your gift for Christmas this year is heat. The gift of heat. 65. <laughs> All right. Next question is from Jonathan Nunes. I am purchasing 10 acres with the house from my grandmother which has been in my family for almost 100 years the house was built in 1945 and three bedrooms plus living room have hardwood oak floors and in some areas over the years the oak planks um, slash slats have separated a bit in between each other i am wondering if you could advise me in the best possible best possible way on how to fill those small gaps and refresh this nice floor. Dirt. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not gonna like my answer. It's so when we, we when we did our kitchen in our house, we did we actually used reclaimed oak flooring. You know the wide planks, and I mean there's good half inch gaps and spots. Yep. Saw it as some pollen. There is. Yeah. Well, no, Sarah was. You know, she would we'd clean and she'd make sure she got all the dirt out of them. I'm like, just leave the dirt. You know, and quickly it'll build up. And once it builds up, you slap a coat of polyurethane over it, and it it seals it up. It's not pretty. You, you could even clear caulk it and poly it. Yep, and they make that. Um, yeah, you don't have to just put dirt in the floor. You know what I was picturing, though? I, you know when we say these hardwood floors, I would just picture them when you, when you scrape off that layer of dog hair and human hair. You could, I can yeah. just picture it and smell it right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it builds up, but it, it does the trick. Um, they make that styrofoam bead. I can't remember. Oh, what, yeah. You know, you could shove that down in there. Yeah, clear cock, but I think, uh, yes, if you wanted to go a more cleaner route, you could do <laughs> sawdust. Sawdust. Wor- sawdust works really good. Yes, absolutely. Something like that. You could even mix sawdust with, you know, a little water, a little Elmer's glue. You know, shove that down in there. I love my wood putty stuff. Yep. But... You know, Bondo. They make a Bondo wood putty. Yeah. But yeah, saw it. It's going to fill in anyway. You're going to fill in. And, you know, they also will expand and contract with weather. So sometimes it's better to leave them open so that in the summertime when it's humid and they expand, it's got room to expand. Yeah, I, I've seen hybrid floors buckle. You do not want that. That's bad. That is bad. Okay. That's all we have for project pointers today. All right. Yeah, and you can always tell when a floor buckles when the guy ran out of nails. <laughs> do you ever think, I hope that I didn't do that? Yeah. Well, and they say if the floor buckles, if the floor cups, you've got moisture coming from underneath. If the floor buckles, if it's concave or convex, you've got moisture coming up under the floor. 
if it's convex, you've got moisture above the floor coming down. I never knew that. Your dad taught me something today. It's getting late. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Pulling him out. He, of the he bag. usually teaches me something. Yeah. But that's yeah, cool. Thank you for those fan quest uh, for those project pointers. Keep them coming. We'll try and answer them best we can. And again, the more detail, the better. And if you have a video, send it in. We'll try and uh, connect with you. We really work well with pictures. <laughs> We're very visual. <laughs> and now we've got a few fan questions. We answer all sorts of questions. So if you've got one, send it in. Okay. What's Maggie thinking about right now? Sapa? Going home. Yep. Harry. Always Harry. <laughs> what was he wearing? <laughs> when? Like, what, did he change his outfit a bunch of Harry Styles? No, he had blue pants and a white sparkly shirt on. And he didn't cha- you know what? I, I appreciate that. He came out in a box. I saw that. Yep. For mm-hmm. Hall- there Halloween, he was is dressed a as Harry Dorothy. In a box. Yeah, he did two Halloween shows recently. He was Dorothy, and then he was a clown. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Are we ready? You sure? Okay. Um, this one is from Pat F. Um, from Lyman, Maine. I'm always curious at the end of a project when you, they are about to show the owners the finished project actually says to Chase, let's go get changed. Exactly where do they go to change? <laughs> <laughs> Wondering where they go if they aren't close to home. Well. I really like this one. I was, let's just give a shout out to Matos. He's been killing it lately. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Matos works for production. Yep. And nine times out of ten, it's behind my truck door. I mean, I love it. I don't have to deal with that part. So they, they make Chase and Ashley look good, and like they don't care about me. I love it. <laughs> Even though we did a photo shoot, and Madoff like brought me this pressed. Like I was like, I have to wear one of those, but he did a good job. Yeah. No. So it before we were allowed to bring our own clothes, but I think the network got a, tired of me showing up with wrinkly shirts pulled out of the back of my. I truck. mean, we're magnolias now, baby. We're not dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> so they started purchasing us shirts. Or, you know, and they would show up and we, well, we get this question a lot too, why Ryan isn't at the reveals because you're at the arrivals, but we found that it's just with the family and the amount of people, it's just too much. And we got a lot going on. I'm usually helping the guys. Yeah, that's true too. I, I feel like I go to the reveal, I go to the arrival so I can yep. help you get an idea so we can order materials. Yep. It's better to have two brains thinking about Cause we see that camp. We're not thinking about it. Absolutely. When we might... We might go see a camp and not go back to it for a couple of weeks yep. because the guys are finishing up something else. And then when – say so when we're doing an arrival, we actually might have some, you know, you know, be giving back some camps as well. Yeah. You know, so I may be moving ahead of you guys. Oh, like, for sure. For sure. And, yeah, you know, or we're getting another camp ready for a yeah. reveal like two days later. So Ryan's making sure that's happening. But, I've been in a couple. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the fish yeah. family. That <laughs> that's was right. Fun. That's right. I was at my brother's. Yeah. So, yeah, we typically change in our cars. Nothing exciting or if there's a work trailer on site. I think you guys should write in the network and say we need an RV that's heated. <laughs> like, yeah, that is inhumane. Making yeah. my wife change and my, my brother-in-law change outside. Or, if, or if we'll change in the camp. I mean, there's a brand new camp right there. But nothing, nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. I mean, really, half the time it's just throwing on a different plaid shirt. Isn't it like, weird hanging out in the camps? I mean, I've been at some before, like... After the, the that staging team comes in and actually the, the girls like it's so it's like it feels like you're in a museum almost. Yeah, no, I mean they're they're it puts it over the top. They really do put them over the top. They don't want me in there after that. I can <laughs> tell you that right now. <laughs> so yeah, nothing glamorous. Great. <laughs> nothing new after two either. That's in an Ed Sheeran song right now. I knew Ed's listening to us finally. Yep. We can't get here, but we can get Ed. <laughs> Don't let Monday ruin your Sunday and nothing new after two. <laughs> Bad habits. Uh, oh, look at me look with at my. You. Wow. <laughs> your dad's actually really hip. All this 92 moose is paid listens off. To a, he, he listens to a lot of. Do your kids still do moose messages? No, it's not a thing anymore. I don't that was definitely that a no. It's tweets. It's, a tweet. it's tweets now. It's oh. so a what? See, when I was your age, like everyone listened to 92 moose, and you'd say, Oh, this moose message, this goes out from Ryan to Ashley. Um, I saw you in study hall, and I thought you're cute. Maybe you want to go to the um, five-hour with me, the roller skating or something. They like. actually did that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And you had to like call over because it was oh, yeah. so busy. You'd, oh, yeah. you'd be lucky to get through. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it like a recorded message you left too? Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Jedi, it's Dixie. I'll see you this weekend. We're going to have fun. Oh, oh, yeah. Stuff like that. No. It was fun. That was weird. You're missing out. Tweets. No one tweets each other. No, no, no. no. They just tweet read anyone. tweets. Is tweeting yeah, text the same yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, I don't know. Should be. Do you not have Twitter? No. I can text, though. That's great. That was the next fan question. Can Ryan text? <laughs> <laughs> can Chase text? No. He does not. He cannot. He does not text. <laughs> you get. I look on him. His and your aunt's phone drives me freaking. It's bad. Cr- they have that red dot with like what, and it has an apostrophe in it. That would drive me crazy. Mine has to be clear of anything. Even your emails. Yep. I've got like thousands nope. of emails. That's OCD, baby. OCD, baby. At least I don't text, got it. I do text people back. He's so though. lucky. I'm like, <laughs> but my my guard has become a oh quick story. My guard has come down a long ways since I've been immoral. So um, Tony, our cleaner here, who does a wonderful job, we finally talked her into coming to our house a little bit because we're so busy. And she looked at me one day and she goes, Ryan, I can't believe this. I remember when you you used to just be the cleanest guy in the world. <laughs> and I'm just staring at Ashley and she doesn't even get it. I'm just like. <laughs> those were the days those were the days we've worn you down I'm much happier now huh? yeah bigger things to worry about yeah when, you, when you're making cool stuff you don't have time to clean that's right that's I right I never made anything cool <laughs> now I'm dirty I'm making clean cool stuff anyways that's it for fan questions yeah great I think we answered those and a few others yeah <laughs> For everybody listening, and now we are on to some new products in Kennebec Cabin Company. I've been wondering what the heck that is. It is a handmade Play-Doh and toy set. It's made by Mountain Mom Studio in Carabasset Valley. It's Play-Doh wooden tool accessories. The set includes two four-ounce jars of Play-Doh and the wooden accessories for different shaping, molding, and just overall playing. We love Carabasset Valley. Yeah, so it's very cool. Made in Maine, local materials. Gotta love it. You can find it at shop.kennebitcabincompany.com. And if you're in a bind, you have your honey thing and you have a pair of tweezers. Like, Oh, yeah. It's multifaceted. Exactly. So, yeah, check that out and all the other cool stuff at the store for your holiday gifts. This would make a great present. So we've, we're fully stocked. And and it's from Maine. It's homemade. You're yep. supporting a local artist. Like, Yeah. Pretty awesome. Yeah. And I want to give a quick shout out to Wayne. Um, I did an interview today with... Wayne Maine? No, just Wayne. I don't know his last name, but I did an interview with Downey's Magazine. And the interviewer's father is a huge fan of the show. Hey, he's, no, he's a huge fan of the podcast. Wayne's dad. So, Wayne, Cheers. if you're listening, thank you for listening. But, yeah. Wayne. We love Downey's Magazine. <laughs> yeah, and so now we just have a quick trivia question. Answer from last week. Okay. So oh, yes, we get the answer. So, last week's question was... Who was the first governor to reside in the Blaine House? Do you know how many nights I stayed up since we heard this question? Yeah, a A lot. lot. I'm going to say... It was James Blaine. Is that your answer too, Ryan? Chuck McKernan. (laughs) Okay. Those are both wrong. It was Carl Milliken, 1919. Why is it called the Milliken House then? Yeah. We're going to need more info. Don't ask me. Ask Google. I'm going to have to do some research on this one. Welcome to the White House. Who said they'll ask Mr. Black? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) And this week's question is... What resident of West Gardner was the engineer and builder of the Panama Canal? West G, baby. Probably a hickey. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be Merhickey. God love that guy. He built everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, a hickey or a good one. <laughs> so if you know the answer, submit it to... I'm going to do some research. Good. Can't Google it. No, I'm going to go... Can I go to the town? If yes. I, all right, if I don't use a computer and I find out, Fine. I win. Sure. Yes. No, go to the Maine Historical Society. Steven, you're yeah. on speed dial. Go to the... I'm going to the West Con to town office. I'm going to talk to my friend Angie. Maine Memory Network. Oh, and Ashley's kind needs to be registered, so I'll do two things at once. Perfect, perfect. And the dogs. Yeah, if you know the answer, submit it, and we will pick the first correct answer and send you a Maine Cabin Master merch gift. Good question. 
Yeah. Or some gift. Some gift. Something. Some cool gift from Kennebec Cabin Company. Another fun hour of uh-huh. just fun. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks to our sponsors, Nelma, Hero Media Network, Hammond Lumber Company, Kennebec Savings Bank. And From the Woodshed, we'll be talking to you. From the Woodshed has been brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp? Trust the quality. Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. From the Woodshed is a production of Kennebec Cabin Company. See you next time.